Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I'm, gonna, I'm here to remind you that, again, it's 6 o'clock p.m. this evening. We're going to have our Tuesday night live Bible study, and I'll be teaching and sharing things. We're going to have Carrie Pickett hosting it, and it's going to be a great, great time. For those of you that have not joined us, we've been doing this every Tuesday night for about a year and a half. We have anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people that usually watch it uh, pretty much live, and then we have others that watch it as we archive it. And one of the things about this Bible study is that it's interactive. And so I'll teach for like 20 minutes or so, and then we will have people send in questions, and I'll spend about 15 or 20 minutes answering questions. And uh, so it's an interactive time, and I've really enjoyed it. It's been a good time. So uh, we have some questions here that I wasn't able to get to last time. Matter of fact, I think that my staff, uh, they actually teased one of these that this was the question I was going to answer and I didn't get to it. So we're going to start with it this week. But Melissa on Facebook said, how do we properly share our country with non-believers? And you know, that is a huge question that would take a long time to answer it. But let me just go back and instead of turning and giving you quotes, let me just make a general statement that I have read the statements of, um, I don't know, all of the founding, and not all of them, but most of the founding fathers, many of our presidents, the Supreme Court, and many people, and I'm, I'm not just talking about two or three, I'm talking about dozens of people that I could go and put my finger on the quotes that said that this nation was founded as a Christian nation, and like, for instance, the first vice president, the second president of the United States, John Adams, said that uh, democracy is totally unfit for anybody but a re religious and moral people. If America ever ceases to be moral, well, then democracy will destroy us. And there's many, many quotes I could give you about that morality is the foundation of liberty. If you give people liberty that don't have the ability to control themselves, then it just produces anarchy. And you could contrast this with the French Revolution that happened close to the time of the American Revolution, but the French Revolution inspired by Voltaire and other people who had made an impact on the French, it was a atheistic, a secular uh, revolution, and I mean it was a bloodbath that descended into total anarchy, and the difference between the French Revolution and the American Revolution was the morality, the religious beliefs of people that the Americans were just wanting freedom from tyranny, but they can control themselves because they had a relationship with God. So I say all of that to say that this nation was founded on Christian principles, and really, uh, Christianity is the thing that holds uh, liberty and freedom together. And I know that there's people today that would really disagree with that, but I could give you the quotes of presidents, Supreme Court justices, on and on, that say that exact same thing, and I really believe it to be true. So how do you share a country with people that have no belief system and are they atheist, or they believe in some kind of a religious system that justifies killing people in the name of Allah and things like that? And really, there isn't any common ground there. Now again, there are Muslims and there's other religions that they their doctrine says one thing, but they don't practice it. They aren't practicing Muslims. And there's many, I'm sure, many people who call themselves Muslims who are peace-loving, but uh, at, at its core, uh, the Muslim religion is not peace-loving, and it is hard to coexist. So all of this to say, how do you properly share our country with non-believers? Uh, it's hard to do. It depends. If, if you get fanatical people in here um, that are wanting to practice jihad and Sharia law, I don't think that you can share it with them. I don't think that they are compatible. And what does that lead us to? I don't know. It's We're in a mess. It's kind of like how do you unscramble eggs? We've already got so many people in here uh, that are promoting things that are completely against everything this nation is founded upon that I don't know exactly where we go. That's the reason we need a revival. We need God to just pour out his spirit upon people. Lee on Facebook said, what is the purpose of the other planets in the universe? Now, I'm, I'm supposing that a number of these questions here are because I taught on creationism versus evolution last time. 
And um, Lee, I honestly don't know what the purpose of the other planets are. I mean, God may have something in mind that is way beyond my ability to comprehend. But I do know that it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was the focal point of his creation. And he placed the sun and the moon and the stars uh, in place to give light upon the earth. And so I really do believe that, uh, you know, this question to me appears like he's saying, well, if they aren't inhabited, if life isn't on them, what's the purpose of them? It could be nothing but just to give light upon the earth, just so that we could have something nice to look at. I don't know. It could be much beyond that. But just because there's millions of planets out there does not mean that they're inhabited. I don't know exactly what the purpose of it is. Michael on Facebook said, when the snake talked with Eve in the garden, why was she not surprised at a talking snake? I suspect this is a rhetorical question. Um, I personally believe it's because animals talked. You know, we have parrots today that talk. You can teach some animals to talk. When I was a kid in the Fort Worth Zoo, there was an elephant that talked. You could get it to repeat certain words. And I don't, I don't know if that's true of every animal, but I do know that today we still see some animals that you can teach to talk. I actually saw on uh, like America's Funniest Home Videos one time that they had a dog that they had taught to say, I love you. And I mean, it was very distinct, this dog saying, I love you. I believe that prior to the fall that the whole creation was different and that it wasn't unusual for a snake to talk to them. Uh, so I think that that's one of the results of sin caused, uh, the. I believe, in evolution, but it's downward evolution, that we started out awesome and we have evolved downward. Irene on Facebook said, Who did Cain and Seth marry? Of course, Cain and Seth, for those of you who don't know, these are the two sons of Adam and Eve. Uh, Abel was killed by Cain, but the two remaining sons, Cain and Abel, it talks about that they married and that they had children. Where did their... Uh, wives come from. Well, all the way through Scripture, this is consistent. You can see it that when it listed the genealogies, it very seldom, just a few times, mentioned the, the names of the wives. It always listed the male children. And you've got to remember that it says when Cain and Abel were full grown, that they came and they brought an offering unto the Lord, and Cain, uh, he had tilled the ground, Abel had raised sheep and stuff. And we don't know exactly how old they were, but we know that uh, right after the time of Cain and Abel and Seth, that people were like 300 years old before they started having children. And so it could have, they could have been two or 300 years old in Genesis chapter 4 when it talks about it. And I believe that they married sisters, that these were children of Adam and Eve, and it just doesn't list the women in the genealogy. So that's the simple answer to it. I certainly know that there was no other uh, people on the earth. Some people have speculated that, but it even talks about Eve and, and Adam named her and the name Eve. I forget the exact literal meaning, but it goes on to say that when he called her Eve because she was the mother of all living is what Adam said. So that right there, the scripture says she was the mother of all living. So all of the people on the earth came through Adam and Eve. John on Facebook said, I really want to believe in creationism, but what about the things we observe happening according to natural law, the tendency of everything to change, develop, and adjust to conditions? You know, I mentioned this on last Tuesday night's Bible study, but either this question came in before I answered it or they might not have been pleased with my answer. But you know, in Genesis chapter 1, the Lord said, let let all of these animals bring forth after their kind. That's talking about species. And so John here mentions the changes we see in natural law. The tendency of everything to change and develop. And people will cite like bacteria, that you can have bacteria, viruses that will become resistant to some kind of a, a treatment and they will mutate into something else. They will mention moths that change colors. They will mention things like this, and they'll say, see, right there is evolution in process. No, that's not evolution, because evolution teaches that one species 
evolved into another species. That has never been proven. There is zero evidence. They've spent hundreds of years looking for some link between man and ape, and they've even claimed that they have found some things like this Lucy uh, skeleton that they found in Africa and other places, but when they examined it, it's not another species. It may have been a person who was dwarfed. It may have been a person who was stoop-shouldered. It may have been a person with a different head size or something, but they are still humans. There has never been and there never will be any evidence of one species becoming another species. You can breed cows and you can come up with a different breed of cow. You can breed horses and you can come up with big horses and small horses, but they're still all horses. Evolution is dependent upon changes from one species to another species, and that does not, it cannot happen because God set the parameters in creation. So when John says that we see this happening around us, there you don't ever see that happening. You see uh, animals or species adapting. And for instance, I've even read about people that are in very high altitudes in the Himalayan mountains and things like this, that their body will begin to produce extra blood cells, their lungs expand. Even here at 8,600 uh, feet, where I am right now, uh, some people that come from sea level have trouble breathing, and the reason they put the uh, U.S. Olympic Center in Colorado Springs is because your body does begin to adjust. You produce extra blood cells, which carry... Uh, more oxygen, your lungs actually expand after about three weeks in this climate. And so there are adjustments, but you never see one person become something else. Again, God, God has made our body so that it can adapt to a degree, but there is no evidence ever of one species becoming another species. I even had somebody bring up a uh, um, caterpillar where it spins a cocoon and then comes out a butterfly. And they say, well, that's, that's a total change. But it's all within that same species. It's just a different uh, stage of uh, like a, um, I forget the exact words that they use. Up, up. Anyway, I won't say it because I can't remember it. But anyway, you see things like that. But that actually disproves evolution because instead of this being something that takes millions and billions of years to happen, it happens in just a matter of days or weeks. You see this caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's very quick. It is against everything that evolution is teaching. There is no such thing as one species becoming another species. Philip on Facebook said, For years all I heard was the earth is 6,000 years old. Why don't I hear it preached anymore? Well, you're asking me to give you the reason why ministers are doing what they're doing. And, you know, I don't know that I'm qualified to do that. It looks to me like that the reason people don't preach on it is because evolution has become so dominant and they have occupied this high ground to where they claim to be intellectually superior and they claim to have facts. And if you speak out against it, man, they just ridicule you as being totally ignorant and stuff. And because of the criticism uh, that is put out there, I think most ministers are just afraid to speak on it. But man, I believe exactly what the Bible says. And uh, I'm not afraid to say it. I think that most preachers, the reason they don't preach on this is because they, they would rather have man's approval. They're afraid they'll lose people out of their church. They're afraid their offerings will decrease. And I hate to say it, but I think that that's the motivation. Again, I don't know for sure, but that's what it appears to be. And here's a person on chat that said, In Genesis 1-9 it states, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. When did the waters separate as in the oceans and such? Let me just read this to you out of Genesis chapter 1. And in verse 9 it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he sees and God saw that it was good. And so this happened on, I believe, the third day of creation. And so apparently the, the entire globe was covered with water at one time. And if you go on and read, I won't take time to read it, but it, God set a firmament 
that separated the waters that were above the firmament from the waters that were underneath it. And as you go on, it talks about later that he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he placed them in the firmament. So this word firmament is talking about what we call space today because it's where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. So there was apparently water that covered the earth to a much greater depth than anything that we see today, but God separated that and took those waters and put them somewhere on the other side of the galaxy. This is just andeology, but it's my personal opinion that probably uh, heaven is where those other waters went, and there is a planet or a place, I don't know if planet is the right word, but there's a place somewhere where heaven exists. It's not just metaphorical. It's a real place and that water is there. In the book of Revelation, you read about the new Jerusalem and in heaven there will be a river of water and there are trees that grow on both sides of it. There's the tree of life and the tree of uh, that is for the healing of the nations and stuff. So anyway, I believe that God separated that water and put it on the other side of space. That's where heaven is. And the water that was left here, he had it uh, go into certain places, oceans and seas, and the dry land appeared. If I had time, I could show you a lot of other things that I've studied on this, but when the uh, flood came, it talks about not only did rain come from above, but it says the fountains of the deep were broken up and you can see there are maps where they have mapped a rift that goes all the way through the oceans and it literally started over around Israel and it goes and it splits through the Mediterranean and down through the soup where uh, the Red Sea is today and then it goes around Australia and it comes around to the Atlantic and all of this and this rift goes all the way around the world and that's where the waters literally came up from the bottom. So there was rain from above, but there was also the depths opening up. And earth is floating. Scientists would say the same thing about this, that there is a thin crust around the earth. And then there's water underneath. And so when the fountains of the deep were broken up, all of this water from underneath came gushing up. And that was part of the worldwide flood. And you can see this rift. It goes all the way around the world. So... Um, Anyway, God created all of this. I believe that he anticipated that, you know, someday man would rebel at him, and he had this in mind about all this. As far as the mountains that we see today, my understanding, and again, this is not one of my areas of expertise, but my understanding is that there were hills in the original creation, but the mountains that we see today came during the worldwide flood. And so all of the mountains that have been formed were formed approximately 4,500 years ago. Now this may raise other questions and people say, but oh, all the ge geological column and all of this stuff shows that they're millions and billions of years old. I dealt with this on last Tuesday night's Bible study and I hadn't got time to go back through it, but I do not believe that. They're presupposing some things. And um, so anyway, we could spend a lot more time talking about that. Tonight we're going to have another Bible study. It'll be at 6 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. I'll be teaching. Carrie Pickett's going to be with me. And it's going to be a great time. So I encourage you to let somebody know about it. You can send in your questions. And we'll try and answer them during the broadcast tonight. But if not, maybe next Tuesday I'll be able to answer some of those. So again, check it out. 6 o'clock p.m. tonight. We'll be going live with our live Tuesday night Bible study. See you there.